to working wisely. Today, we're going to be talking with Francisca Hoischkel, who is the co-founder of Space and Pepper, which is a fascinating interior design and building concept agency that has imported tactics from software design and user experience design into the physical world. Um, this is a very interesting time to be considering these topics, obviously, as uh, public space and private space gets reimagined because of the uh, COVID-related social distance, which we're all somewhat subject to. I talked to Francisca about that, but also primarily where she got her inspiration to do such a multidisciplinary job and what she thinks about validating assumptions as a designer um, in a space where at least the feedback loop of software design is a less familiar topic. So uh, without further ado, here's Francisca. Hello, Francisca. How are you? Very well. How are you? I'm great. I'm curious, what is your favorite uh, thing about working on buildings in Berlin? Well, there's some excitement that you always have about discovering and unpacking some of the details about the history of the buildings. So you obviously have a lot of them that are brand new or just being built, but there's also a ton we're just trying to discover like what's going on and from what era they are. Just like, for example, Funkhaus. I don't know if you know it. Funkhaus, yeah, that's where uh, Tech Open Air is. And, uh... Yes, exactly. And like you get in there and you have like these beautiful old like cozy large rooms and you really get a vibe of the former GDR like East German style yeah a friend of mine one time described the repurposed buildings from uh, the Soviet era as post Soviet chic oh wow that. yeah post Soviet chic as a tongue twister yeah we have our own uh, German word for it it's kind of this like DDR chic DDR chic there's also like uh, people see it differently. Like for me, actually coming from the East, it's like connected to so many emotions from an era of a lot of suppression. So I have a hard time kind of like looking at it like, oh, you know, that's so beautiful. And, you know, it's just an emotional kind of like a little bit charged. Yeah, there's a political uh, sort of undertone to someone whose family has origins in that part of the world that would not be felt by say someone from North America who is uh, just kind of, you know, s struck by perhaps uh, financially costly, bold construction projects. Sure. Or also who's just like looking online, you know, like Googling cool old spaces in Berlin. And then you go to a place and like, Oh, beautiful. Soviet Union chic. I like that word. It's like very hashtagable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Soviet Union <laughs> chic, or, or I think I understood it as post-Soviet chic because okay. it's the. It also is meant to encapsulate the uh, kind of uh, novelty-seeking millennials who want to live in a space Ooh. that feels, uh, to use the German word, einzigartig. You know, very, very nicely, singular. Yes, very nicely pronounced. Oh, thanks, thanks. I've had some time. Uh, but I mean, maybe that's another way we could segue into what you do. So how would you describe what you do and the relationship that buildings and their repurposing um, have in that, in that role? Yes. So what I do in one sentence is I humanize spaces. And that means more precisely that I apply a human-centric approach to the development of mainly community spaces. And how that translates into my, you know, day to day, how I go about my daily hours is in different ways. Um, I have worked on a living project. Um, I kind of have a hard time calling it a, a hotel because it's so much more than that. But in a very basic way, it's a hybrid space with, uh, you know, rooms and workspace and some other very, very cool elements. And I also co-founded uh, the agency Space and Pepper that professionally does uh, UX design for spaces, as we like to call it. And um, for kind of like the third part is uh, kind of my passion uh, projects, my way of talking about these topics that really move me, and that is how to humanize spaces and basically create better places to live and work. Okay, so what does it mean to humanize a space? So if I play devil's advocate for a moment, let's say I'm someone who's putting together an office. And I'm concerned about my bottom line of how much money I can save, what are the uh, minimum practical needs for my employees to sit down and work. Um, and I am, I am just trying to do that. And I am someone who's not convinced 
my space needs to be uh, humanized. What are the consequences of my my uh, viewpoint on that? Assuming that's my viewpoint. I, I would say the viewpoint you described is something I've heard and seen a lot, so it's probably very realistic. Just as you said, the real estate industry and the developments in general are largely driven by profit, by yield, and also by the political energies in a city like Berlin that is kind of like by different districts trying to control what type of developments make sense, whether it's housing, uh, social housing, commercial areas. So there's a lot of energies and influences into these type of decisions even before you decide to create uh, an office space or something. Then if you were to be the lucky one who's like, hey, I get the check mark, the Bauamt in Mitte or Kreuzberg is like, hey, you can go ahead, you can build your work streams headquarters here uh, in Kreuzberg. Then, of course, usually you get your investors or if you, you know, kind of repurpose an existing building, there's a lot of technical decisions you have to make. So you hire an architect. The architect hires an engineer and then there's all sorts of very technical planners. So this is usually right the process. So you probably think about, oh, yeah, I mean, um, I'm going to work here. Maybe I have some, some of my client meetings here. Maybe I have a podcast. And, um, you know, you, you take decisions and your architects may ask you a question here and there. But usually there's a planning process that is followed by implementation. And then you're kind of locked in and you open the door and you walk into your office and you're like, oh, you know what? Like I have a podcast spot and it's a little echoey or I don't have a dedicated or like really feel good place to have my lunch. Or, um, it I is a little echoey in here, isn't it? <laughs> I was not, see, I can also be devil's advocate. A little bit. <laughs> um, so the idea behind humanizing spaces is to think about and integrate the user needs, the user being, for, for your example, you, your team, but also the people who visit you, podcast um, interviewers or interviewees, and also maybe some client pitches that you have. And we do that concretely by following a human-centric design process, which is very related to design thinking. Um, there's uh, basically a process that probably if people work in with digital products, they're very familiar with. But the, the idea that is so impactful for me is the application of a process into an area or an industry that so far has very little to do with human-centric design. That processes. makes sense. So to slow down and backtrack maybe just a little bit, for those who don't know, um, what is design thinking? What is human-centric design? Yeah, human-centric design, which is very similar to design thinking and also um, is at large uh, similar with like user-centric design. So human-centric or user-centric is uh, used in a similar way. Okay. In very simple terms is the idea of including the user's needs and wishes into the design process from start to end. And what's the benefit of that um, commercially as well as uh, design-wise? Yeah, I will kind of... Um, answer that question for my area because I'm sure like every every expert has a different answer but in terms of space design the impact that it has especially for community buildings so if you build your private office you could go crazy right like red walls hyper echoey uh, buildings or, or walls you know and you could be fine if ambulance you know that, is driving by all the time <laughs> exactly if you're into that you know nobody would come and uh, kind of complain but let's say you're talking about a community space, a public space, let's say a hotel lobby, a co-working space, a, a coffee, like all sorts of places that have multiple user groups. The large benefit of thinking about and actually empathizing with these people is that the finished product is much more suitable and better fitted to their needs and it's not too late because in my previous example, you open the door, you come in, a lot of decisions have been made and you could have easily, by thinking in detail about the use cases, have made better adjustments to this process. 
So the first one basically is really this kind of better product for your needs, which results in usually and uh, you know reducing costs and uh, increasing your or reducing your opportunity costs. But also, let's say for a co-living uh, concept, and we've worked with a lot of co-livings, um, which is uh, maybe if if you're not familiar with it, kind of the living equivalent for co-working. So it's the idea to share a certain living spaces. Some providers even have shared apartments where you have like a little sleeping room or community spaces. And for those type of models, it is it creates a much better market fit, a much stronger positioning, you know? Like let's say you want to target, um, you know, like your... I'm talking very stereotypical right now, like you're a millennial, you know, Bali loving, uh, <laughs> you know, yogi, like uh, 16 hours, uh, intermittent fasting, you know. And I just want good vibes. <laughs> I want to be a life coach. I exactly, need my space. Exactly, like vegan and you're going on a two months um, uh, self-growth trip to, uh, I don't know, the south of Europe somewhere. Um, designing that type of co-living is completely different uh, than, let's say, for a project worker who has two homes, who's commuting between Munich and Berlin. But the implications are actually much more fundamental than just space layout and interior. Mm -hmm. But it also concerns, and that's one thing that's also a big part of uh, Space and Pepper, our work that we do, is the user experience. And I'm sure you at Workstreams, you think a lot about the user experience, the UX, the UI of your product. And I hope you do. <laughs> we, we certainly uh, think about it a lot, but that would lead me to my next question, which focuses on at least how I understand user experience as someone that's designing software. So I understand the human-centric design approach of gathering information, ideating, and then you know prototyping and testing something. But what I don't quite understand is I, I see the clear advantage of doing that for a software because I can design a software, I can put it out into the world with essentially no distribution cost thanks to the internet, I can get feedback, and then I can change that software in real time. If this button needs to be moved here to make something more clear, if this arrangement is more pleasing to the eye of a majority of our user base and we figure that out, we can move it. But if I'm in the world of atoms, physical space like you are, I cannot design the interior of a Southern European yogi retreat and then constantly iterate to get closer to some sort of um, user-centric North Star the same way I can with a software. So I understand that human-centric design through the lens of the very easy task of augmenting software, or at least easy when compared to working with the material costs of physical space and physical objects. So what I understand is the biggest break there is if I'm a designer of, say, super nice Scandinavian furniture, I design the furniture, it must be marketed and sold. I cannot change the furniture once it's in someone's home. So what? Mm -hmm. how would you respond to the idea that human-centric design is most effective when distribution and production is essentially a sunk cost and free to meddle with, where in yeah. your case, you get one shot, right? Um, there's a lot of things talking about testing and, you know, iterating, 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 iterating. It's a very complicated word to say three times in a row. Iterating, iterating, uh, <laughs> iterating. Everyone can do it. Um, that which is an essential part of um, the process of design thinking, you know, getting your prototypes out ready and testing it and getting feedback from user. So there's a lot of things you can do, and that means testing the final product with, um, you know, your preferred wood on the floor, with all the art on the wall, with uh, the perfect color that you wanted for your window frame. So like the finished product is kind of the way it is. However, let's focus on what you can test and iterate. And that is a couple of things. The first one, uh, which from my experience, may be one of the most impactful, is the iteration of the concept in a very early process. 
That means that if, um, let's say you you have, you know, you I don't know if that's your plan, but uh, you say, let's say PayPal purchases work streams for 10 million and you have the money to actually make your dream come true, which is, I just say, it's your dream to open that uh, like Southern U European yoga retreat. Excellent. And um, <laughs> now everyone knows. And uh, so you're investing um, that 10 million and basically you have your ID in your head, perfect. Like all the yogis of the world are gonna come and you know, they're gonna spend, I don't know, a thousand euros for two weeks. So you make a lot of assumptions. Right. And we can test those assumptions, which is not granted in the industry of how buildings are being built. So there is usually kind of a, you know, very boring word document of like 20 pages that describes the usage of the building of the different rooms. There is in only a few examples, Zoku is one of them, um, where there has been... Zoku the, House. No, Zoku, oh, uh, the co-living in Amsterdam. Um, it's Z-O-K-U. Z-O-K-U. I was wondering if you just said Soho in just a very <laughs> dramatic voice, but I wasn't. I was, oh, Soho. I'm, I'm, I'm behind on the lingo. No, no, okay. with, a, with a different accent. I um, digress. <laughs> Sorry, please continue. Um, so they were one of the pioneers and became very famous for that in talking to, and I was actually at their construction site like five years ago. Um, when uh, they said, you know, they talked to, I don't know how many, but really a lot of millennials to kind of understand what really their needs are. So to get back to your question, testing the assumptions about the user, meaning the people living or working in your space, is one very important aspect that we can do. The second point that we can test and prototype and develop is the actual space design, meaning setup and layout floor plans in the, the most simple sense. And that means, let's say you have a certain uh, needs for your Bali, uh, your, your European, uh, Southern European yoga retreat. I should have just said Bali retreat. <laughs> let's, let's, let's just uh, agree to call it the, we're going to move to Bali. Let's call it the Bali yoga retreat. That just made, uh, made things so much e easier. And, uh, Let's say you make your assumptions and you find out just by talking to maybe 20 people, actually, you know, um, their needs are completely different than you thought. Like they come there to really do some work and, um, you know, maybe even have a team outing or people come there to uh, spend five or six hours a day, like not interacting with anyone. So all of these Uh, insights that you get can either help you adjust your target group, be like, oh, actually, I don't want to um, target A, B, and C, and but only A and B, mm -hmm. um, and then also help you develop the the layout. If you had the luxury to start from scratch, which is not always the case, a lot of buildings are already built. I mean, Berlin, um, everything has been repurposed at least eight dozen times uh, yeah. since the you know the Kaiser times, if I can say it like that. Which, is very, which makes it even more frustrating to me when I see new developments. And again, there's still a lot being built in, in Berlin. Um, when I just feel all of these uh, big towers are just kind of, uh, you know, stumped out of the ground and they look very similar to the ones that are already, you know, everywhere in Germany and not really thought through. Well, it's funny because, you know, what I find interesting about... Uh I guess this this kind of new luxury condo architectural facade that has dominated Berlin in recent years, the kind of uh, minimalistic style, mm -hmm. is its um, peculiar a resemblance to Plattbau in some yeah. in some fundamental ways. Which, um, for those who don't know, Plattbau was the sort of minimalistic style of uh, social housing in uh, communist East Germany. And it is kind of ironic when you take an idea to its furthest extreme, you end up with remarkably similar uh, dreariness in the communist uh, era. It was about minimalizing the individual um, to, to feel like a part of a larger society, whereas in a hyper, a hyper cost cutting uh, commercial venture, you're um, minimalizing everything just uh, to cut costs uh, without a clear ideology. So it's funny that we're on one hand, a very intense ideology made one structure, a very um, almost painfully non-ideological uh, mm -hmm. approach created a very similar aesthetic. 
Yeah, I like that you called it like uh, you almost uh, like sold it better than what it was because it was just like a bunch of concrete blocks like um, which were very uh, practical to move around and just kind of like stacked on top of each other. But in a way, it's true. It's very modular. It's very like easy to assemble. <laughs> it's in a way very easy also to disassemble. So Post Soviet some chic. In it. I guess so. <laughs> Um, well, uh, next question. I mean, this is, but this is a very interesting thing that I think you guys do very well from looking at your website is you do have this sort of bigger picture approach to your designs. So I, I remember, yeah. I recall an interview I saw once with Dieter Rams, the uh, German designer who, you know, indirectly gave a lot of ideas to that thing we agreed to call Apple um, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, very practical, minimalistic design. And they recently asked him about what he thought of Tesla. You know, isn't Tesla this groundbreaking, amazing uh, thing? Are, are you impressed by it? He said he was personally not impressed. Oh, wow. Because he thought it was short-sighted to solve modern transportation issues at the car level. And he said he thought it'd be more interesting to work on the infrastructure level. And that, um, that just the obsession with speed and appearance of the car drove him nuts um, mm -hmm. in the auto industry and why he never wanted to work in the auto industry but shows uh, consumer electronics. Um, I digress, but the reason I, I, I point that out is because, um, I mean, I know from your own website that you've done offices, I mean, co-working spaces, even restaurants. I mean, and in those situations, you do have in some ways the, the requirement of looking at something, I don't want to say collectively, but you have to consider more variables than just an individual unit, like a, a single object or a single product. You're really, you're really thinking more systemically about the relationship between a lot of different variables and, as you said, different user groups of people. So, yeah. So if we return to my my fictional uh, kind of uh, doubtful office manager from before, who said, you know, like, why should I humanize a space? Mm -hmm. Um, I want to pose the question when people don't take something resembling a human centric mm -hmm. approach as for most structures, people don't, how many choices good and bad do you think get, uh, designed unconsciously versus consciously? That would be a great uh, study to do. <laughs> and I would love to see that chart. It would be very helpful for what I do. Um, What I will say is, um, because you touched on a lot of topics um, that I would also love to comment on, the holistic uh, approach, which is a word that I try to not use because it's just on everyone's website. It's too good. That's why it's overused. <laughs> uh, exactly. But for the lack of alternatives, I'll stick to it. Um, the beauty and kind of the challenge of it is user experience is everything. Um, if you have a beautifully user-centric design product, let's say like the Apple iPhone, or now that I've seen the SpaceX launch, also the interior of this beautiful Dragon capsule, um, that of course is something that has a, when you use it, an impact on your, uh, on your mood, on um, how you can use it, what needs it uh, suits, etc. But when you think about a space, like everything that is in this vault from, um, you know, the air quality, the temperature, do you smell something? Um, what is the playlist in, um, you know, in your body retreat? Uh, what, what did you set up? to lose furniture, um, but also apart from everything that you can actually touch, there's also the whole aspect of how are you greeted? You know, what does your staff do? When I came here, you guys were sitting outside, nicely welcoming. I didn't have to like look out, you know, scoop or look out for uh, your company sign somewhere. Like uh, you have a little chat, like there's, a, this is also an experience, if you will, which is much softer. That does not mean that I personally walk into a space and kind of give a, a breakdown of how you should welcome people. But the service design can be mirrored or included into your user journey. You can think about how do you want people to experience in space and what needs to happen on the other side in order to produce that. So that is a huge benefit of user-centric design and that also makes it almost 
inevitable in oh no, another one that is so hard another word so hard to pronounce you cannot um, avoid it that it is a very holistic topic so you cannot just think about one thing but that's where I think a lot of people get lost and I think that you've done a good job of of, of circling is this holistic concept or I mean you can easily get lost in the molasses of this experience is everything argument. And then it mm -hmm. becomes very hard to create benchmarks for if something is performing well. Yeah. So let's go back to my, my fictional Bali retreat, which I guess our first decision was it will not be in Southern Europe. Um, <laughs> I, I'm curious. Okay. If, if I have a, if I've always dreamed of building a yoga studio in Bali, yeah. Um, the first thing I'm thinking is, okay, everything's experienced, but given the constraints I have, how many things can I practically deal with? Mm -hmm. And the second one is how many of those are just fairly intuitive and don't require much thought? Like, I mean, he, let's take a, we'll, we'll, we'll turn our cynical office man into a cynical yogi mm -hmm. and, and say like, um, you know, it's obvious people need uh, yoga mats. They need uh, some vegan food and they need some, you know, fun looking uh, Buddha stuff, some namaste posters and, and that's it. And I don't need to think about it beyond that. Um, what, what, what can you do to make my, my yoga studio more successful than something I haven't already thought of? Um, because you certainly can do a lot of things right just by following your intuition and your own experience. If you have done yoga somewhere, if you've been to Bali, you kind of can recall some of the experiences you had that were nice. Sure. But in terms of if your goal is to stand out and to provide a really good experience to your users and also position yourself as the reddest Bali retreat all over the world. Then you want to go like take it one step further, just like um, Apple did, just like Tesla did, and you name it, your company that you really admire. And then you start asking those questions like, okay, so great, you have, you know, which yoga mat you want to use. Okay, so do you, where do people stack them? Like, you know, what about hygiene? Like, do you want to put a sanitizer there? Like, what if people do yoga there, but then you haven't thought that actually next door, um, you know, you have your, I don't know, early morning uh, musical therapy outside and that's annoying uh, the yogis inside, you know, then people are cooking your beautiful vegan lunch and the smell is coming out. So there are a lot of details that are very hard just from your experience and talking to maybe a technical engineer or an architect to uncover, which is why also a, a process is really highly collaborative. It's um, very difficult for one person or someone's intuition to like visualize an experience try to um, forecast uh, challenges or pain points. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, if you have, you know, unpacked or um, hidden all of the pain points, also look for opportunities that make you go beyond what is expected. Like if I book a trip at your retreat, I kind of will have a certain expectation, you know, around the vibe. So you also are in a position where you need to anticipate and maybe even over deliver and over achieve um, something that will make me go like, wow, I've never seen anything like that before. Can you think of an experience where maybe you had a client or knew of a situation where somebody unknowingly, maybe either through constraints or through being in uh, maybe f f in a hurry, possibly um, did not anticipate an expectation that their space was creating or failing to create? Mm -hmm. I actually have, uh, just as you uh, put this question together, I thought about into two directions because I've been, I've experienced exactly that. And I've also experienced where people without, to my knowledge, uh, having a very user-centric uh, design process by just by the mere fact of being so passionate and taking a very long time because our process also is a kind of, if you will, a slow design process. It's more mindful, it's more conscious, it's more intentional. But to get to the first part, I have in my mind like a list like, <laughs> you know, like in front of my eyes, a list of uh, examples where people just really make mistakes in terms of their planning. And mostly it's about very trivial things. It's like, oh, 
you know, you put the laundromat, let's say you have a nice, um, you know, co-living space, your Bali retreat has like um, three floors, super nice. And you need a laundromat, right? People are staying there for a month. So, um, you know, where do you put it? Ah, it's not a really like a nice, sexy thing. So you put it somewhere, maybe you dug a hole and you have a basement, you know, so you put it somewhere where people don't see it. But now, you know, people, if they want to uh, do their laundry, they kind of have to walk through the common area and the lobby and uh, maybe uh, the yoga session is going on with their laundry bag. It's not laundry bag. It's not a particularly good feeling. Maybe in Bali, it's all right, but not necessarily if you're like in Hamburg uh, by the airport. So there are some very uh, trivial things that, however, have an, have an impact on your experience and the way you uh, perceive that concept. Okay, that, that makes sense. So then if, if I were to go back to the example of, of uh, missing something, what about where someone anticipated something? Maybe is there, is there a time where you helped a client identify um, an expectation that they were creating, as you put it, or, or could create that would be beneficial to them? In terms of uh, where we helped them anticipating something they already knew or we uncovered uh, either one. I mean, I think it's good to talk about maybe one that you uncovered because mm -hmm. I think it, it, it will make us look better. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it just seems, it seems harder because if the client already, already knows what they want and your job is to execute, um, that, that's to me, forgive me if I'm wrong, that seems like that'd be easier than, um, going out into the dark and pulling something new out. Yeah, and it's a very, uh, it's it's not an easy also talking about the interpersonal parts uh, of like trying to convince people um, that something they in their mind, they put so beautifully and it made so much sense to kind of challenge that a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah, we do that. It's a good thing about um, following a user-centric process because you're never the one to blame. You're like, well, I talked to 20 people, you know, like I'm not the one telling you to put your laundromat um, maybe into the ground floor, but I've talked to 20 people and I can tell you that's what they think is good. So in terms of anticipation, I mean, yeah, it's we have a lot of these topics in terms of um, floor plans, um, in terms of having a very multifunctional functional space that does not work in, in real life, or at least that's what we assume, um, the way they want something to happen. Um, like this, this floor plan adjustment is a big topic and very important because you want to do it at a point where it's still possible. And the other, maybe to kind of move away a little bit from uh, floor plans, is the um, kind of like the, the pivoting of the business model in terms of the user you want to target. So we had, um, with the work that we've done, we've seen a huge impact um, with, especially in the co-living or living segment um, of uh, operators that had just unrealistic expectations in terms of target group, um, length of stay, and um, price point. You know, like Those sound like things that could help someone save quite a bit of money <laughs> um, if they got them more correct earlier on. Correct. And also sometimes it is just this uh, like kind of like a bitter pill also to swallow because it's not um, like you want the person who is in your community space to be extremely pleasant and extrovert, but also mindful, you know, and then of course, also maybe in terms of income, able to pay a certain price point and then booking all of your services and um if you have to realize, okay, this person does not exist, or if he exists, he's probably going to stay in an Airbnb. I cannot, you know, like prove to you that, that they would actually um, go to Bali and, and take a yoga retreat. Then um, that results in usually some um, frustration, but also a very valuable turnaround and adjustments in terms of user profiling and targeting. And then how do you rank the priorities of what things you work on for something as uh, interconnected as a community space? So if I, if I, maybe I'm thinking too much in task management terms, but if I have like a to-do list and it's stacked from top to bottom, mm -hmm. um, how do you decide where the laundry basement is relative to the dining experience, relative to the ticketing to reserve something relative to the yoga studio itself 
how do you how do you um set your priorities yeah. based on a limited uh set of constraints i um i kind of have like a two-faced answer that i'm trying to not look like i'm chickening out but ideally i don't make that or i don't take that decision um but you do or the user that we've talked to kind of dictated is you the client for example um yeah like in that case like you um you know you would be the the client who, in my example yeah what i just said <laughs> mm -hmm. okay so uh that means that we're trying to um like we would have a workshop with you where we're like okay but what is your goal i mean it could also be that you feel so strongly about something that does not necessarily necessarily be tested with a user it is just a vision that you have and that also we try to incorporate into the way we prioritize uh, prioritize certain um, topics or design challenges that we have but usually since it's a very organic somewhat chaotic process of just testing and shuffling insights around and making sense out of them you kind of get a feel for like critical areas let's say um, the okay. type of level of service you want to offer, the, the price point, the length of stay. And maybe I can point out in your community space a couple of, um, you know, areas that don't work in terms of a customer journey. And then the priori oh my God, um, the way you prioritize these topics. Um, I realize like switching from nouns to verbs, like sometimes if you do it in writing, it makes so much sense. But then you say it and you're like, oh, wait, like, how do I pronounce that? I mean, try, um, try learning German when it's not your first language. <laughs> oh, well, your okay. Verbs, I don't, I your don't verbs. agree. That's true. Okay. Well, all <laughs> That's right. That's a user experience. <laughs> I was um, trying to get some points here. But yeah, so it, just to finish that point up in, uh, in terms of how you want to like prioritize those, usually it's budget. Then let's say I give you all of these insights. We'll be like, oh, well, I can't change so much with my floor plans because we're at the stage or it would cost me too much. Or, you know, I already pitched that type of business model to my investors. I kind of stick to it. There's all sorts of influences. That makes sense to me because it's, all, it's also it's also twice as interesting when you consider that you guys also do a lot of branding and market research. And I mean, I think this is where I, I do see a parallel to what we do for a software, for example, is that we really do try to align how we um, work on our product with how we talk about it and how it appears in one setting versus another. So we do spend a lot of time, for example, trying to identify um, our key user groups. We mm -hmm. want to market to them the right information with the right sort of emotional tone. And then when they arrive at our product, we want some glimmer of that marketing and that branding to be reflected in how the product works so people are not, uh, you know, disappointed. Uh, yeah. So I, I, can, I can see that parallel really well. Um, I'd be curious to know what about this sort of challenge um, has changed um, in our post lockdown or post semi lockdown uh, COVID 2020, what will happen next uh, world? I mean, community spaces have a lot of new constraints on them. Yeah. Um, new constraints, but also so many more opportunities to become the center of attention and of activity of a lot of people. Um, I will say that the, uh, the pandemic had, from what I've researched, and actually with Space and Pepper, we were just kicking off um, kind of an experimental study <laughs> with humans. That sounds horrible. No, but where we interview people because we've seen so many researchers that like talk about, uh, you know, market developments, like um, occupancy, et cetera. But we really wanted to be like, well, like how did people live and work through this crisis and what does it mean for space design? But from what I've researched so far uh, on a more macro level, there certainly will be um, this shift from home office to really an office at home. And uh, especially in uh, in the States, and you may know that better uh, than I do, but I've talked to some... Unfortunately, I do. <laughs> I've talked to some friends, at least in, Sil uh, in Silicon Valley, which is still a very special place, but um, she works for Salesforce. And, you know, as, as uh, you may know, a lot of the tech companies gave their employees permission to work from home until the end of the year. But she told me, I don't anticipate going back to the office Monday to Friday ever again. 
like five days work week is not going to happen. So if you think about what that means for even for a company that big, also for some of the other giants, like in terms of actual workspace for them, you know, do you need a cubicle for every person? Uh, you know, is there maybe the bigger focus on creating very functional collaborative space where you can dive into workshops, creating very nice, uh, more casual environments to have your work lunch uh, together. So that completely changes the needs in terms of uh, workspace just to stick with working, but also um, kind of like your setup at home, right? Like I heard about, you know, people when they were all doing their Zoom calls, like you heard like, you know, kind of reorganizing your setup so you have good lighting for the camera and you're kind of looking in your background, like, you know, what's mm -hmm. going on there. Like, these are little things, but if it becomes more common, let's say if I were to design the quote-unquote perfect, um, you know, place and God forbid, but if we're in a similar situation again, like if you had the liberty, we probably could come up, just the two of us talking with a setup where would maybe that would work a little bit better working from home, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. I mean, um, it's also intriguing that you think even further beyond, you know, what are the constraints of uh, the current pandemic and what will this long haul work from home binge do to our expectations of how often we'll be in the office all together. Yeah. Um, so then it, that draws me to the next uh, question, which is how did you take such an interest in space design? Like um, I know on your website it says, let your space tell a story. I mean, how did you just personally in your own career uh, come to be interested yeah. in space design? How did you come to take um, user experience design principles used by Silicon Valley people and see a, a reason to apply it to um, community spaces what what first triggered your interest in doing that yeah it was certainly a very uh, zigzaggy uh, process um, that i can say this, Iterative. this journey <laughs> exactly um and i would say that it was kind of like in different chapters so um i grew up in east germany like a place where there was not that certainly was not the case right the government was kind of like dictating the way that uh, any building was being built many things were um, standardized yeah absolutely like there was no personalization no, reason, no 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 space whatsoever in more the abstract sense for creativity and ideas and also the work was highly regulated so that's probably like the most extreme um, spectrum. Um, but I, uh, I come from a family of actually engineers and architects. But interestingly, I was never interested in it. Like I remember my parents taking me to construction sites and I was like, ugh. <laughs> like, you know, they, they pulled out, uh, you know, all of these tools and like measuring stuff. And like, I found like, you know, being in concrete, like it's cold, like, you don't feel comfortable. So I knew very well, I thought I knew, um, I was like, this is not my thing. Like I'm going to do business. Uh, I always was interested in, um, and not the concrete business. <laughs> yes, exactly. The, the business business. And uh, so I went actually after school more into the uh, business management, intercultural communication. It's a mouthful direction and um, was really happy kicking off my traditional corporate uh, career. I actually lived in New York for, for six years. And to be honest, like uh, I was very, very uh, naively convinced that this was the right thing to do after you do your MBA, you start a nice uh, position in business development and voila. Um, but I've all like there was a time uh, very early on where I felt extremely constricted in terms of my creative output. Uh, and it happened to be that I worked in uh, work for Lufthansa. I worked for some other like companies in the widest sense in tourism. So I could travel a lot. And I was like, oh, these experiencing other cities, other places, other hotels, talking to people. I was like, this is uh, apart from traveling. Everybody does so travel, of course. But, but like the essence of experiencing spaces in a different environment was very fascinating to me. That's where I want to interject. So there was a point where there was, okay, no architecture, no engineering, going to do business. And then creativity enters the story. Yes. So where does that start? And creativity in terms of uh, that kind of like stepchild, I always ignored, right? Like, so I always 
thought of myself as a very creative person, but I worked in a highly uncreative, like sucked, sucked out the creativity out of my day to day. Did that life. help you in some ways? It helped me because it, it put me into a, such an uncomfortable position that I felt uh, the more I ignored it or when I talked to people who were doing something that was really creative and creative not necessarily in the uh, you know visual designer way, but just creative strategies, problem solving. And I always got that itch and I thought, oh, this is like, this is dope. Like I would like to do that. Um, but I kind of like the excuses that I used. I was like, oh, I'm on a work visa in the US. I really love New York. I had a great community there. Um, so I felt just uh, for, for a certain amount of time comfortable until I didn't. And then one day uh, that kind of was the, the straw on the, what's the phrase again? Straw? The last straw. The last straw. I never knew why it's a straw, but. Um, neither I do, neither do I, to be honest. What's the German equivalent? Um, die Nase voll from, or something? Ich no, glaub, that's die too. Kirsche auf der, no, this is also English, right? The cherry on, uh, on top. Well, to be honest, I cannot think of I think the, the, the cherry is right a good, I think of cherries as positive things in my in my normal life. The final <laughs> straw. Okay, I'll, I think about the German equivalent. Maybe I can um, think about it. But I got a call one day, very to to paint that picture as I was walking down busy New York. Um, uh, that basically was an offer I couldn't refuse. Um, and there was building a boutique hotel from scratch in Berlin and doing the conceptual Whoa. development. Yes. And I was extremely enthusiastic and then I was extremely scared. And I was like, well, I mean, I've never in my life developed a hotel. I'm not an architect. I'm uh, not a project manager of a building. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, I was very, uh, I was like, I mean, this is not, not going to happen. But uh, I was like, well, if I don't do that, though, like that would kind of hunt me. Like it if I, you. like this would be the type of things that, you know, I could, uh, I could feel, I could sense that would uh, be just unreasonable to explain to be like, oh, no, like I just kind of like had this beautiful offer to have influence on a landmark in the capital of Germany. But I said, no. And I squandered it. <laughs> exactly. Well, then, I mean, it sounds like your your interest in seemingly unrelated variables was already pretty well, uh, like, matured at that point. Because what's interesting about your story, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that when you chose to go the creative route, you already had a very good uh, literacy in a sort of a business world, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Like, I can say as a designer, one thing I wish I had was more just general financial terminology available in my, in my mm -hmm. quick recall or, or uh, just a little bit more knowledge about business best practices. Cause I think that what, what must be very helpful when you're dealing with all those variables is also the ability to um, articulate a point in the right language for the right stakeholder. Yeah. I mean, you know, it did and it didn't. I could write fantastic short English business emails, but then I came back to Germany and I had to deal with uh, the German institutions, which don't work like that. So I had to go back from dear Frank to sehr geehrter Herr. Mit freundlichen äh, Grüßen. Meine, <laughs> meine vorherigen emails bereits ausgeführt. Könnten Sie bitte? So um, it was actually counterproductive because people also perceived me as too American or Americanized for that business culture. Oh, I I'm was curious. <laughs> I'm curious, are the aloof, casual, smiley Americans uh, dawdling around? What's the stereotype of being too American if you are German but lived Ooh. in America? Okay, I have to add a disclaimer that also uh, I moved in a very, very German industry, which is construction, so engineering, architecture companies. I would say at least the ones I was moving in um, were like not the most well-traveled uh, cosmopolitan people, but um, I would say the uh, kind of like the stereotype certainly was this kind of like, oh, little chit chat at the beginning, casual, you know, kind of like laughing things off and then talking business, but also being very salesy and very like positive, overly positive um, which is something apparently if you're building a building, there's so little positivity because you constantly have problems, constantly, constantly. 
like there's hardly anything working basically maybe i'm too american but that would that would be uh, in my mind a reason to try to be positive if the if the baseline is negative to begin with but. we even had like at one point we had um a very uh nice person we worked with uh like an interior designer and uh, she used the word magic at one point and i loved it i was like yeah it's magic what we do and some of the people on board were kind of like eye rolling like you know like It's not magic, like it's like how you put a pipe from A to B <laughs> and how you like paint the walls. So it's, it's don't be naive, it's not magic. Yeah, like so there's <laughs> almost like this, uh, um, like we are married to our seriousness and, um, you know, like so it's, I had to kind of uh, unlearn some of the things that helped me very well navigating in corporate America to kind of that particular project I was working on which was and still to this day is the most challenging thing I've ever done in my life. Wow. It's like four years, it started around about four years ago. It's just like constant discomfort and feeling overwhelmed uh, because it's a new development. So it's one of the few buildings in Berlin that's actually brand new. Mm -hmm. And the amount of decisions you have to take, which have such a big impact on cost, on planning, The amount of people being involved, um, the amount of long meetings you have that are so highly technical um, and the amount of knowledge I had to acquire to, um, to get to a point where I was somewhat fluent in the language, constantly feeling like, like an imposter, like, you know, like, why am I here? So that was uh, a very steep but very painful learning curve. But it's interesting because it sounds like the painful part also uh, might have also been, at least as you tell it, sounds like there was, there was a reconciliation very personally with uh, trying to put together something that had magic, to use your word, marrying magic to practicality and getting the right dosage of both, right? Yes. Because um, you don't want to be so practical, you are sterile nor uh, so magical you are unable to execute the thing you're dreaming about, right? There was such a good quote. It was a bit long at the end, but that was like, I think that can be on a t-shirt or somewhere. That can be on, an, on a post. Slightly long t-shirt. <laughs> you those, don't want to be too practical. One of those easy shirts that magic. like droop a little bit. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Um, like there was a couple of beautiful things that happened doing this very painful uh, journey. And that is... Like I really firsthand saw the impact of UX uh, principles on spaces. So I kind of brought on board a UX designer and I was just like uh, impressed by what a process like that can do and um, how also it gives you tools to use when you talk to architects and engineers because One of the most important things in the work that we do, because human-centered design is great, you say you have a great presentation, you know your user, you know your principles, but then it's like, how do you apply it to a meeting with 10 people, five architects, two people who just do sanitary, you know, like one person who does just does electricity. Yeah, that's what, so, I'm interested, that's what I'm interested in. Like what impressed you beyond the general jargon that surrounds design thinking, human-centric design? What did this experience with the UX designer um, introduce to you? Yeah, it, just the, first of all, the process. Like I... I was somewhat aware with the, of course I was aware with design thinking, but that always felt not practical enough to use for the process I was going through, which was basically deciding what type of doorknobs you want, you know, like deciding what the floor plan would be like. And the process that I was introduced to, I found highly valuable. And then I just had to become creative in a way and in finding a way to communicate it efficiently and also um, answering the more specific question. Let's say, um, you know, you come up with your personas, your user journey, and then you really look at a floor plan. And you're like, okay, like how do you think your user is navigating through the space? Okay, here could be an important thing. So the next time you're in a meeting, you talk to the person who's, you know, picking the doors, the entry door, you're like, actually, I need the entry door to do X, Y, Z. I probably should have this style. So it, it gives you really these guiding principles to take a lot of decisions and also to communicate it uh, practically. The personas did. 
personas, but also the process, like the tools, the, um, you know, like uh, design principles, the, um, uh, like the user journeys, like all of these type of uh, ways to represent your user's needs. Mm -hmm. And then I guess that would make sense that you would, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by the, by the kind of journey from the space to the UX and then, and then how did it, how did it end? What was the moment yeah. of relief? Well, okay. So there's, um, like it's still ongoing. So there is the, for me, it never was, ends. No, there was never the point where I was like, oh, now I'm done. I see my finished product, my beautifully designed product and everyone loves it. You know, like you just don't get that gratification. If you get gratification at all, it's probably the slowest gratification in like, you know, ever the in world slowest history. slowest gratification ever. It's like That's broken tempting. down into increments of like, you know, five or six years. So it's extremely uh, difficult and you have to produce it for yourself. You have to be like, wow, like, you know, the other day it, it has a rooftop, like I was standing on the rooftop and it's like you get this feeling when you first start experiencing the space, uh, you know, that that does something to you. Like, wow, like people will love it. And the, I would say the most beautiful thing that came out of it until now, now that this project is not ready, based on the insights, all the learnings that I made starting something like that from scratch is um, the agency space in Pepper that I founded uh, with Hannah, my co-founder, where we were like, okay, this is so interesting. And she came, you know, she worked for Airbnb. She has her own startup uh, for an event agency. So she came from this very community-driven um, part she's a super social person probably the, she knows every French person in Berlin I believe she's French um, and <laughs> so when we talked together and I was like you know I'm working on this project and she's like yeah you know like I work I create event experiences and so we kind of came together together and now we're on a mission to at the end of the day, create better experiences for people in spaces, which I find to be highly satisfying and gives me a strong purpose yeah. because that is something that is, um, and that's the beauty about me not having any gratification, but I, I have at the same time the knowledge or hope, something in between, that it will give people a good experience for far beyond my lifetime. I'm being a little dramatic right now, but usually if you have a building, you know, it can be like 50, 100 years. And if I right now have an influence on designing it better, then, you know, even when I'm 80 and there's a next generation, they will be like, oh, you know, it's kind of cool. Yeah. And that is cool. I, I, that's off where people definitely don't have the luxury of thinking anything they do will matter in 100 years. But <laughs> Yes. Well, um, I mean, some people do, but it, it certainly is. It is beautiful, but it's also you just don't get that quick fix where you have a finished product and you are like, oh, see, like your sales went up like 500 percent because you increased the UX. Like, you know, that that also gives you this like proof of concept. Yeah, but I worry about it, too, because I sometimes think that like when you work with software, you risk kind of like uh, getting into some sort of casino feedback loop where where uh, you're constantly getting hit by new new uh opportunities to, to take action and 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 uh and there is uh like my per my personal feeling is you know sometimes sometimes taking like just five more minutes to think about something could could save you 50 minutes uh yeah like down the road or or, or five days i mean it, it's it's funny how um it's funny how especially with with um i guess it's true for for spaces as well as for software but a person has to spend as much time thinking about the right decision as producing all the things that are just chosen or decided on. I yes. Guess. Um, Very true. And uh, how do you deal with, or I guess I should say a different way. How do you, how do you deal with differences or not differences? How do you work with your co-founder to, um, I guess, reconcile your ideas? You know, if one person comes from, one discipline, one person comes from another, mm -hmm. especially if one has some sort of deep connection to the Berlin French mafia. I mean, <laughs> how to, I'm sure that's fun as well. How, how, do, how do you take the, the social aspect of it and the practical aspect of it and divvy it up between the two of you? I hate to now fill into that stereotype of being the pragmatic German <laughs> who like fills in for the functionality, but I, I get your point. Um, I would say that 
again, the answer is kind of we do a user centric approach. Mm -hmm. So um, we more have to reconcile, like, you know, what is the best approach for our client? Like, what are best practices we can share? We don't have a lot of in terms of ideation since it's a co creation process. The goal is always to have the best product for the user. And that from honestly, like, I don't think we ever have been in a situation where we were like, oh no, like you think this is better for the user. I think this is better for the user. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. It, it really did not happen. If you have a strong idea and when, you, when we talk to people, we interview a lot of people personally, then you're like, no, like you get a feeling for that person. You're like, yeah, I know. Like he you're or both she on board. Would, yeah, there's, there's not, uh, there's not this, at least we haven't had it yet. Um, where we were completely different of different opinions. Okay, no, that's good. That's mm -hmm. good. And then, I mean, I don't want to feed into the 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 practical German and the uh, <laughs> <It's okay>. sensuous <laughs> aesthetic <laughs> French. Um, yes. But I mean, uh, surely it's more complicated than that. But I but I think, um, do you enjoy, or when you look back on the career choices you made, the way you work, um, do you feel like? It, in some ways you, you have succeeded in uh, kind of getting the right bits from a, from a practical mindset and a playful heart, if I can mm -hmm. put it that way, the magic and the, I like that. And the <laughs> master engineer must work together. Yes. I, I feel I had actually this moment uh, coming a little bit back to, to my life story. Well, a part of it is when I actually, when I had my parents, um, like coming to the construction site for the first time, and we actually could have this like eye to eye conversation. And I was like, you know, they use X amount of tons of concrete here. And like these windows had to be installed that, that way. Thing and you didn't <laughs> like turned out to <laughs> exactly. be helpful. Exactly. Well, because now I had a different lens through which I could look at it. This like, I chose that space because I wanted to be like that. And from the beginning, kind of my vision for this project and that I gladly share with the developer was, can we create a space where Elon Musk and Richard David Precht, like a pretty famous German philosopher, or Yuval Noah Harari, where they could meet on a rooftop and kind of like solve the world's problems. Like what would it take to have a space that would inspire you in that way. Would the space allow the other two to listen more to Harari? <laughs> I actually, you know, now that I said it, I'm like, I, from what I know, they may all be like a little bit socially awkward. So we probably need to add to the mix someone who's like highly talkative and like chatty just so they could actually have a conversation. Yeah, let's get, let's get, uh, who can we throw in here? Let's get, uh, like a Jimmy Fallon or like, uh, you not know, Jimmy like Fallon. a. <laughs> Well, maybe you have a better uh, pick for like late night. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave late night. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna, I'll throw Dave Chappelle in or something, something. Oh, very yeah, fair, that could work. That could work. That could work. So Eli. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what do you think about? <laughs> it was a good Chappelle. Yeah. So that that kind of, uh, in a way, reconciled some of the. Um, some of the things I very strongly was against in my childhood. And now I was like, oh, it's actually beautiful to create something. It's also very labor. Like it's, you can feel it, touch it. It's not digital, you know, like you can see it, you can feel it. And uh, that, that's a very, looking back, um, it kind of makes sense. Also, uh, the business studies helped me a lot in terms of, because the, the big labor of what I do is, kind of convincing people of the value proposition that we have. Yeah, and it's institutional the, almost, but it's it's like the systemic relationship between not just the uh, the aspects of the space, but the aspects of the people who put it together. Yeah, and just the cynical, you know, like work office owner that you described, like this is, a, you know, typical. Okay, now, now we're really into stereotypes for this podcast, but it's okay. Uh, but it's really something we encounter a lot. So it helps to kind of, put yourself into the position and be like, how can I explain the actual value, like the measurable value, the ROI of investing in something that at first glance slows you down and questions some yeah. of the decisions you already made. It's kind of uncomfortable. So there my business studies helped. And I would say from, um, you know, that decision I took to uh, move back to Berlin and going also, I became self-employed. So the discomfort kind of like uh, quadruples. That's a little stressful. <laughs> I, I, I was self-employed for a long time. And I, I know the, uh, I know the, 
the stresses that that can induce. Yeah. But I also have a lot of empathy for for our cynical, uh, fictional yogi office owner, uh, Bali, whoever it is. Just throwing it all in. I just yeah. throw it all in because I think that, that that stereotype is really just a voice in everyone's head, right? And it's that stereotype of um, if I'm trying to do something um, that has a, a unique value, how do I how do I convince myself and other people um, of the best path? And I think people um, very much want to be respected in what they do. And it's very hard, especially when you're dealing with um, non-numerical variables, as many design things are. It's very hard to ignore the voice of your in your head that says, oh, that's that's just precious or that's biased or that's uh, silly, right? It's, it's easy. It's easy to, um, it's easy to get lulled into a false sense of practicality by not taking risks or not considering things that you're currently considering. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, if you do it just for yourself, you can follow your intuition. You, you don't need to justify it to anyone, but I would say just, If you are that self-aware or maybe you should aspire to be or a person in that position should to kind of acknowledge that if more than you or your family is using a space, there's a lot of things you just don't know about their day-to-day -day behavior. If you have different functionality, that amount of questions increases. If you have people traveling from different countries, it increases. So that is something I think in awareness you should have if you don't have it um, then you know okay so be it but it would just increase in a better design product and at the same time I would say because usually buildings that are um, already there kind of put a, a corset on you right like you cannot move around freely you cannot take so many free decisions but if you really put that thought into the experience and I've been to places um, Like one of my favorite places personally is the Children's Firehouse in London. It's a it's very luxurious in terms of the, I mean, it's price point and everything. But you can just feel the moment come, you come in that, and I don't I don't know if it's by uh, following a user-centric uh, user process, but somebody put so much thought into it that you can feel it. And that is the same type of idea for me let's say you would really uh, you would set up your apartment like you're welcoming someone or whatever and you think about every little detail oh they're staying at my place I'm gonna write a handwritten note they probably want the wi-fi password like if you have this kind of uh, appreciation of someone who is using a space of their needs or what you could do to make them happy for mm -hmm. me that's the same type of thinking And if you apply that, whether it's following a process or just by like kind of turning every card and thinking, what else could I do here to make it more cozy or to make it more workable or whatever, then this is already the right direction. Yeah. So then when you're, when you're um, not working, um, well. <laughs> <laughs> however few moments in the day that may be, yeah. um, what, what kind of things are, um, are on your unstructured to-do list what do you like to do when when you have that work-life balance actually uh i went uh, you know we talked about work streams we talked about slack i um i i had this very uh also talking about uh, uncomfortable but this very harsh self-realization like i You know, I do my goals, like my quarterly goals for all the projects I work on, Space and Pepper, the hotel, but also like myself, what I what I want to do. And I realized that in all the goals I achieved, the ones that I wanted to do for myself, my own self-growth, my own well-being were always coming short, like always, always, always. So I took the decision to have a Slack channel just with myself. It's a little embarrassing, but I noticed I that, the, that I, the way I structure the week, my goals, my the different topics I want to work on, it. First of all, as a, like for my own user experience, it makes it so easy because I can shuffle like, oh, you know, a space and pepper, you know, I, I, but then also me, oh yeah, I wanted to, I've been talking about writing an article for such a long time about exactly what we're talking about today. I've been putting off, putting it off. And now I'm just like, okay, I, today I'm going to listen to a podcast about writing. Uh, next week, I'm going to write a ton of Tim Urban posts and try to understand why they're so awesome. And you're, and you're currently generating a podcast. 
I am. So I guess that's like, actually, there was a little uh, goal I had. I was like to do more talking um, about topics I'm passionate about. So um, to answer your question, uh, when I don't uh, do what I do, I still feel highly driven by my purpose that I uh, kind of am committed to. And I love uh, talking with people about it. I love to um, explore channels to also visually currently. I'm trying to think how I can visualize more of these topics that are so abstract. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, if you're not familiar with UX, if you don't work in real estate, it's almost like it's, it's very difficult to, to simplify it. But I'm, I'm currently thinking about how I could do that. Any um, purposeless nonsense um, in there as well? Or, or, is, every, or is there Everything always a goal? Everything is purposeful in my life. <laughs> no, I do. Uh, actually, I have a current, I have obsession topics. I have completely random obsession topics where I completely indulge in reading random Wikipedia posts like... Uh, to give you a couple of examples, I really obsessed over the Michael Jordan documentary on Netflix. It was so good. It was so good. But I went deep. I never like had any interest in the NBA. I didn't even know. I mean, I know that was the NBA. No, but it's too human. It's deeper than the NBA. It's like, oh, but it's so good. And then I really dug into like, uh, like all of the, you know, like Dennis Rodman's biography. He was my favorite too. But, you know, did he you see? He comes off looking pretty good in the documentary. He did. And then I actually, I don't know if you ever watched the Hall of Fame uh, speech from Dennis Rockman. Like it was so touching to me. So then I started talking about and everyone. I'm going to watch it. Yeah, it's really I was like, wow, I liked him before and now I kind of appreciate him more. So and then my latest one is uh, I'm really into space, like, but not just like, oh, yeah, space, space X. Like I started um, into Sozu rockets because those can do a lot of things. Space rockets, rockets are can. so fascinating. Like I'm, I've never in my life would have thought that I said this, but I'm like now I'm like, oh, my God, the Falcon 9. <laughs> you know? And then um, colonizing Mars. Like I'm I just actually downloaded the You could the design Martian. the first space on Mars. <gasps> wow, that would be a first that would be first. Yeah, I, I listened to, um, I just started listening to The Martian, like the audiobook, and um, all of these like engineering thought processes are like really uh, interesting. So, yeah, I would say that's, I mean, it's not completely uh, useless, but it's not necessarily getting me anywhere to now know a lot about the 1990s um, Chicago Bulls uh, performance, but I well, do. You never know, you know. <laughs> it could maybe in a client meeting with a, a, a Chicago Bulls aficionado, it could help me to drop some knowledge, but. Yeah. that's about it but I mean I guess some experiences are nice when because the, there's not an objective right yeah and just uh, I really enjoy uh, learning about things that unfortunately because I don't have the best memory I just tend to forget then a couple of months later but like for a quick moment I was like pretty fluent in talking about these topics nice nice well um, Francisca I really appreciate you taking uh, the time to talk to me today and uh, I look forward to hearing uh, about uh, when your next article comes out. And uh, and no uh, pressure, but okay. <laughs> no, no pressure. And if that if that doesn't happen, just uh, tell me how you've cultivated your inner Dennis Rodman. All right, that's the perfect note. I will end on this. I will aspire to be the Michael Jordan of humanizing spaces, which is I think no one ever or said. Or the Dennis Rodman. <laughs> or maybe I go the Dennis Rodman route. Could be more fun potentially, and more of a work life balance. Get to hang out with Madonna. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Take care. And that concludes my conversation with Francisca. If you'd like to learn more, you can always go to spaceandpepper.com to discover some of her design concepts and other things her agency is currently working on. Um, besides that, thanks for listening and see you next time. Take care.